approval from the FDA tonight, a major milestone in the fight against COVID-19 as the Pfizer vaccine makes history. We'll talk about what it means for rural America. Welcome to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren, and you are a big part of this show. 877-731-6733. We invite you to join our conversation tonight. That's 877-731-6733. We know that the pandemic has had a very unique impact on rural areas, and we want to hear from you tonight. Joining us, as always, world-renowned Dr. Jeffrey Gold, the chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And later on, we have a very special guest, an expert in cardiovascular systems. We're going to talk a little bit more about that coming up, but let's get right to this breaking news tonight. How is the FDA approval of the Pfizer vaccine being received tonight, Dr. Gold? Well, I think it's being received extremely well, at least uh, across the medical community. And of course, as I'm sure we'll get a chance to talk about a little bit later, uh, there are an awful lot of people in the United States, uh, colleges, universities, businesses, the federal government, the Department of Defense, the Postal Service, uh, so many others uh, who are just waiting uh, for the full Food and Drug Administration approval of, if not all, at least one of the vaccine products. And so we're really thrilled to hear that the Food and Drug Administration has completed the approval process with all of the usual rigor, and that now this product is out with a full FDA stamp of approval. And we know that that is not easy to come by, so it's huge news tonight. Let's start with the latest numbers. It couldn't have come at a better time. How widespread is COVID-19 in rural America tonight? Yeah, Christina, unfortunately, uh, the numbers in our country continue to grow. We should put this into context and just take a look at what's going on across the rest of the world. And as you can see, we're at just over uh, 211 million confirmed cases worldwide, which grossly underestimates the total number of cases, and roughly 4.5 million confirmed deaths. Almost 10,000 people died just in the last 24 hours. And I point out to our audience that both of these are 4% increases. And when we look at the uh, world map, uh, what you can see is uh, there were parts of the world, such as China, Russia, uh, parts of Western Europe, <clears throat> probably for a long time South America, that were the fastest growing segments. But that has changed now. And uh, what we're seeing uh, is parts of the Middle East, still some parts of Europe, but look at the United States, uh, look at the Caribbean islands, uh, et cetera. Uh, we're really seeing some of the fastest growth and expansion uh, worldwide. And that's demonstrated uh, in this particular graphic. Because if you look at the total number of cases uh, that we've seen in the last 24 hours uh, here in the United States, uh, you can see that we're almost 150,000 or 36 percent higher in the last 14 days. Uh, just over 92,000 Americans hospitalized. That's a 43% increase uh, over the last two weeks. And again, we have tragically, tragically exceeded 1,000 deaths per day in the United States, which is a 95% increase, bringing us to 628,000 confirmed deaths uh, in the U.S. And again, what started off in just the tips of Florida and Texas, Louisiana, Arkansas, uh, Mississippi, is now continuing to spread uh, across our nation into the Pacific Northwest, uh, into the Great Plains, uh, into the true Midwest Great Lakes area, areas that were very lightly colored. They were either gray or pale yellow or at most amber uh, weeks past. And every week uh, this seems to progress. You know, and when we start to uh, look at it by state and the, across the United States, as we said earlier, 45 cases per 100,000 per day, but Mississippi is still at 120,000 uh, cases, uh, almost three times uh, the uh, U.S. average. Florida, Louisiana, Alabama are still seeing very substantial uh, numbers of new cases, which then translates into hospitalization, unfortunately, and death. And when we look at these case curves, so this is the case curve going back to the very beginning of the pandemic, there is no question that we're in another surge here in late August, just as, we're, by the way, we're getting ready to go back to school and, and athletics and so many other things, outdoor concerts, uh, Labor Day holiday. 
Uh, you know, when we look at this curve, it's very easy for our eye to play tricks on us and to think we're starting to produce an inflection point or a peak. But in reality, we're not. What we're really seeing here is just delayed reporting for the last 24 to 72 hours, which tragically, week over week, still looks like a very steep uptick uh, in the number of cases uh, per day. Uh, we can look at hospitalizations, uh, Sheridan, Wyoming, <coughs> uh, Union, Pennsylvania, Berkshire, Massachusetts. Uh, again, quite high in terms of the numbers that are hospitalized <coughs> on a totally day-over-day -day basis per 100,000. This chart, of course, to remind us that the overwhelming majority of what we're seeing now is what's called the Delta Plus variant. That's the B1652.2 variant that was originally identified uh, in uh, India, as we may remember, several months ago, but is now spread worldwide, accounts for well over 90% of all the virus in the United States. Although we are seeing some Lambda variant uh, and a little bit of Gamma variant now in the United States, when we look across the country, uh, what we can see pretty clearly uh, is that, depending upon what part you're in, it's almost all Delta variant, what we call the Delta Plus variant, which has got very significant implications for disease transmission, hospitalization, uh, contagion, and others. And we've reported several times in this slide from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention that compared to the original variant, the Delta variant is probably six to eight times more transmissible and one and a half to two times more likely to have people end up in hospitals, higher chance of vaccine breakthrough, et cetera. So the approval today by the Food and Drug Administration of the, Fi of the Pfizer vaccine, formerly known as BNT162B2, and we can't call it that, of course, so we had to give it a new name. So the Pfizer company now calls it Comir uh, Date, uh, which is a new name, but for the same vaccine, that has been in the arms of over 90 million Americans. Tremendous news today, Christina. Absolutely. And we had an opportunity to talk with the White House vaccine coordinator, Dr. Shu Care. Here's what he had to say. The FDA has approved the first COVID-19 vaccine, previously known as the Pfizer vaccine. It now has another name. It's going to be marketed as Comir Nati for the prevention of the disease in individuals 16 years of age and older. White House Vaccinations Coordinator, Dr. Bashara Shukar joins us now with the very latest. Thank you so much for joining us. This is huge news. I think a lot of people who were hesitant, who were waiting on that FDA approval, can now go out and get the vaccine if they've been holding off. Tell us a little bit more about why we should be a little bit more relaxed about this news. Well, thank you, Christina, for having me. And you're absolutely right. I know there are um, a lot of people who are still undecided about the vaccine, they have been waiting for this full approval before getting the vaccine. Well, now that moment has just come, and the FDA, as you just mentioned, uh, just approved, they gave the full approval to the Pfizer vaccine for 16 years old and older uh, this morning. So if you are one of those folks who have been waiting for this approval, now is the time to go ahead and get vaccinated. You know, I think a lot of people might be wondering why the name change. Can you shed some light on that for us, please? Well, that's a, uh, that's a process that I would defer to the, uh, to, to the company, to Pfizer and to the FDA. But I have to tell you, I mean, there's been an extraordinarily complex process uh, that the FDA undertook to ensure the safety, the effectiveness um, and the quality production of this vaccine. And they have been reviewing literally hundreds of thousands of pages of preclinical data, clinical data, details of the manufacturing process, inspections of the sites where this vaccine is being made. So I know the FDA has worked literally around the clock, um, and this was one of their top priorities. And we know the FDA is the gold standard for safety. So people now can be even more confident that this vaccine meets those high standards and a safe and effective. That was Dr. Shukar, the White House vaccine coordinator, and I know that his job has been heavy throughout the past few months in particular with this Delta variant. Dr. Gold, let's talk about what this means as the Pentagon has now moved to make vaccinations mandatory in line with FDA's approval. 
Do we think we're going to see more vaccine mandates widely used going forward? You know, Christina, I do think that we are. We've already seen quite a few in the healthcare industry. Uh, we've seen some in schools. We've seen some in large undergraduate universities across the country. But this assurance that the Food and Drug Administration has had a full process for approval will produce, I believe, a number of businesses, uh, local governments, state governments, etc., more universities and colleges, K-12 school systems, uh, and indeed uh, <clears throat> even more healthcare organizations uh, to move in the direction of a, quote, vaccine mandate. Now, every time you talk about a vaccine mandate, this is going to be no different than any other type of vaccine mandate that we have had in the past, which means that for good medical reasons, religious reasons, etc., people will be able to get an opt-out uh, for that. But hopefully it will continue to accelerate access to the vaccines. You know, what does this mean for booster shots going forward? If someone originally went with Moderna and now they see that the Pfizer has been approved by the FDA and they want that third shot to be Pfizer, will they have that opportunity? Well, right now, the recommendations from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and from the uh, Food and Drug Administration are that if you got Pfizer originally, you should get Pfizer when you get a booster. If you got the Moderna uh, vaccine originally, uh, you should get the Moderna vaccine uh, as a booster. Uh, and they've been silent just yet on the J&J Janssen product, just as they're looking at more data, uh, because don't forget that came out a little bit later with an emergency use authorization than the other two. However, uh, right now, I mean, there is scientific data uh, that shows that it is safe to mix and match the two MNR, mRNA vaccines. That is data from Israel and from different parts of Europe. And indeed, there's even some preliminary data that if you mix and match, uh, for instance, if you, the larger study was AstraZeneca first, followed by Pfizer or reverse order, or mixing the order of a Moderna and a Pfizer shot, uh, that there seems to be a longer duration and higher antibody titer production associated with that. Uh, I think the reason the FDA and the CDC have not recommended it is that we haven't really looked hard at a clinical trial, at a so-called prospective clinical trial, uh, to answer that question. And in an abundance of caution, we know that boosters of any type are going to be beneficial, given what we're seeing across the United States right now. Do you think that we will see more people who have been hesitant so far going out and finally rolling up their sleeve? Do you think that this is what's going to help people who've been reluctant up to this point to finally get the vaccine? You know, I do. You know, here in the upper Midwest, in the Great Plains, I have the opportunity to speak to many individuals uh, who are what I would call vaccine hesitant. Uh, and, you know, for many of them, it will make no difference at all. Uh, but I think there's a significant number of people who have always relied upon the Food and Drug Administration approval process. And don't forget the emergency use authorization for diagnostic testing, for antibody levels, uh, for the so-called PCR tests, for the antigen tests, etc., uh, were all developed uh, in response to the need of this particular pandemic, you know, back in the winter, in the coldest months of 2020. And so getting a full FDA approval will do two things. One, I think it will enhance the confidence of some of the people who are vaccine hesitant. But another very, very important thing it does, and our audience may not be aware of this, it allows for clinicians, physicians, healthcare professionals, to participate in what's called off-label use. That is to say, if there was an individual who was 11 and a half years old, let's say, uh, with the way the emergency use authorization was created, you could not have used either the Pfizer or the Moderna uh, product. But now, uh, for individuals, uh, you could possibly do that uh, in what's called an off-label use, which would be a pure, completely ethical and legal approach. And so I think what we're going to be seeing is more of this off-label use, both for primary vaccination and for boosters. I think we're going to be seeing a Moderna approval in the next uh, week, 10 days, maybe uh, two weeks. And then we're going to be starting to see some very strong language regarding booster shots.
which hopefully will be sometime in mid to late September. Wow. You think Moderna, that we'll get that approval in eight to 10 days. You haven't been wrong yet. So I would put my money on that, Dr. Gold. You know, let's talk a little bit about another concern that is facing rural America right now. Health officials, they warn people not to treat COVID with a drug that is meant for livestock, especially in states like Mississippi right now. Talk a little bit more about what's happening and what you're hearing about this. Yeah, so unfortunately, uh, the drug is uh, ivernectin, which I'm sure our rural community knows well. It is a very commonly used uh, drug for uh, deworming livestock. Uh, it is available over the counter uh, in uh, all sorts of feed and uh, veterinary uh, facilities. I'm sure you can buy it online in uh, unlimited quantities. And unfortunately, there's just been so much social media uh, that it see that people think it either treats or prevents COVID in individuals that have had high risk exposures. And, you know, right now, the science does not support that. And there have been a number of trials with either ivernectin, uh, in a human preparation, by the way, not in a livestock preparation, uh, and uh, in combination with other drugs that have been shown to work, such as anti inflammatories and COX 2 inhibitors and, and others. Unfortunately, the poison control lines and the health commissioner of the state of Mississippi just issued a plea to say that the number of poison control calls that they're getting from people that are overdosing on huge doses, literally equine, uh, you know, and bovine doses of ivernectin uh, over the counter has just skyrocketed. And that's because of the number of cases that we're seeing in these states and the people that are getting hospitalized with an exhausted health care system and unfortunately, an incredibly high uh, case fatality rate. Now, having said that, there are multiple experimental drugs, new drugs that are in clinical trial right now that are oral antiviral drugs that may have a very strong effect in not only treating uh, and preventing severe symptoms and death and hospitalization from COVID-19, but also for high-risk exposure. And we're participating in one of those clinical trials. There are two large pharmaceutical companies in the U.S. and one in Europe that are currently in what are referred to as phase three or late-stage uh, clinical trials. So there is light at the end of this tunnel, uh, without a doubt. Uh, a, the vaccines are going to be fully FDA approved. There are better, newer oral antiviral agents uh, that are coming through the pipeline. But unfortunately, we're still seeing a good deal of what's going on in Mississippi and other states. Because when your health care system is, is exhausted and there are no beds in ICUs and hospitals and your family is you know, falling ill, people will do desperate things. But this over-the-counter drug is not a good choice. It will only result in bad outcome. Mm. I'm really glad that you shared that warning with us tonight. Now, we are going to pause for a quick break, but you probably have questions about the FDA's recent approval of the Pfizer vaccine. You may have a question about something else. Any question you have, that's the beauty of this show. Dr. Gold has an answer for you. And when we come back, we're going to spend a little bit of extra time tonight talking about the long hauler effects of COVID-19. We'll be joined by Dr. Daniel Anderson, the Chief of Cardiovascular Medicine at UNMC. Our phone lines are open. We want to hear from you. Give us a call at 877-731-6733. I'll slow that down a little bit. 877-731-6733. We'll be right back with more Rural Health Matters after this. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. Joining us once again is world-renowned Dr. Jeffrey Gold, the Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And we welcome tonight's special guest now, Dr. Daniel Anderson, the Chief of Cardiovascular Medicine at UNMC. Now, during the pandemic, he's been studying how COVID-19 infections have impacted human cardiovascular systems. He is the principal investigator for multiple clinical trials and his research has received funding from the National Institutes of Health and the American Heart Association. Thank you, Dr. Anderson, for being with us tonight. We're grateful to have you here with us. Christina, it's a pleasure. Well, let's jump right into it. We like to use our time wisely on this show. We always think about difficulty breathing with this disease. Tell us a little bit more about the impact on our lungs and how COVID-19 can also impact the heart. 
So I think I think it's an important thing to understand is is kind of alluded to, you know, there's the clinical presentation is primarily that shortness of breath. But what we've also learned over the past months of studying the impact of uh, COVID-19 disease is that it also affects multiple other organs. Um, we see an impact on heart and cardiovascular function, both during the early stages of infection and even later on during the times where the, we typically think people get better, and then all of a sudden they'll kind of relapse into some are having some pretty significant heart failure symptoms uh, that are also associated with shortness of breath. And that's the cardiovascular system. It also is impacting brain and multiple other organs as well, well after the acute virus, so the early virus infection is resolving. Mm, you know, the heart is so important. If something does impact the heart or our cardiovascular system as a whole, how can that actually affect the entire body? So I, I think that's a great distinction. What we're learning, and I think we don't know all the answers, but I think there's more and more information out there that this is actually something that's probably impacting the vessels, the cardiovascular system. So those blood vessels, as you know, carry blood to the heart, to the brain, to the lung, to the liver. And I think we're seeing the fact that we see inflammation in these vessels, what we call endotheliolitis. So that's the, that's the cells that lie in the interior of a blood vessel become inflamed. And with that, there's the increased risk that you might have little thrombi that form occlusions of those small capillaries and essentially like little heart attacks that affect the organ. And as we know, when you occlude vessels within the heart, you have that heart attack. But if you include vessels within the brain, you can have a stroke. And so this is different than the classical heart attack or stroke, but it still compromises oh, that organ of blood flow. Uh, you know, it, it, this is so important to have this conversation tonight, especially because now we're seeing with the Delta variant, more children actually getting the virus. So I will ask you then, is there anything people can do if they think that they are experiencing these symptoms, Dr. Anderson? So I think it's important that we recognize, you know, whether you are infected with COVID and you have those symptoms, because while we may not have a very specific treatment for what I was describing, you know, we can support somebody, um, you know, whether it's with oxygen or kind of standard of care therapies. So I think it's, it's important to seek help and understand that where this is impacting them as an individual, is it the heart, is it the lung, is it the brain, all the above. Oh my goodness, that's why it's so important to get that vaccination. And Dr. Gold, I'm, you can hear me, I'm sure at this point, right? Check it. Okay. I didn't know yep. if there was an audio issue or not, but I do want to ask you how much of the population has been vaccinated at this point? So, Christina, we continue to make progress and we continue to make progress faster and faster. So I have a couple of graphics I'd like to share with the audience just to illustrate this point, if we can, please. Uh, this is a chart that looks at uh, the number of people of all ages in the U.S. So 51% are fully vaxxed. Those 12 and up, which is, of course, the only group that are uh, approved by the FDA with either emergency use authorization or, as of today, full FDA approval, 60%. And for those that are older, more vulnerable, 65 and up, 81% uh, uh, of the population. And if we look at uh, the rate of vaccination... You know, back in late April, early May, we peaked at about 3.4, 3.5 million doses being administered per day. And then as the numbers started to fall uh, of cases, the vaccination rate fell through all of most of July till it got down to just about a half a million doses a day. But over the last uh, week or 10 days, tragically, as the Delta variant uh, continues to spread, across the United States, it has continued to rebuild towards that million dose a day mark. Indeed, we've had a couple of days in the recent week that it exceeded the million dose a day mark, but the last seven day rolling average is about 840,000 doses a day. Now it's not three and a half million, but it's definitely moving uh, in the right direction. And again, when we look at this map of the US, uh, you can see uh, California, uh, of course, uh, the state of Washington, uh, Pennsylvania, uh, <clears throat> parts of uh, Connecticut, uh, Maine, etc., cetera, uh, much higher rates uh, than the parts of the Deep South, uh, the Southeast, and other parts where we're continuing to see uh, more spread of uh, 
of COVID. Indeed, when we actually look at the uh, projections uh, for, you know, what we've affectionately called herd immunity, uh, originally, you know, we were looking at 70% fully immunized uh, in the uh, summer, this summer, if we stayed at three and a half million doses uh, per day. But we're now looking at October 27th, which is a you know, heck of a lot better. You know, you think about it a month ago or six weeks ago, Christina, 70% uh, herd immunity. Uh, <clears throat> that was back in, out in February. Now February looks like 85%, which is frankly what we're going to need. So we'll keep chipping away at it. And I'm hoping that by the time we're together next week, given the current FDA announcements, that we're going to be seeing uh, a continual uh, uptick. Okay. So let's keep our fingers crossed. Absolutely. We absolutely will. We're going to go to the phones now. 877-731-6733. This is a live broadcast. We are taking your calls live on the air tonight. Don from Arizona is up first. Thanks for joining us, Don. Go right ahead. Yes, doctor. I have a question. If someone finds out a couple of days after they've been exposed to someone that's acknowledging that they've been tested positive, what is the possibility of time that will lapse before they would test positive if they've gotten it from that party? I, I hope that makes sense. Yeah, sure it does. I got it. Uh, so what you're really saying is if someone has what we call it a high-risk exposure, which means less than six feet for more than 15 minutes, which is, you know, five and a half feet for 16 minutes. Not sure that's exactly high risk, but you get my point. Uh, longer period of time, closer exposure to somebody that is confirmed, meaning PCR uh, positive, particularly if they're symptomatic. And the, the key to being symptomatic is that those are higher viral loads, more chance of spread due to cough, sneeze, surface contact, etc. So what we've been seeing with the Delta variant is that the time to uh, infection is shorter. What used to be uh, five to seven days is now typically three to five days. And indeed, uh, the, the symptoms that we're seeing are slightly different because we were first seeing loss of taste and smell and then congestion, runny nose, cough, and then shortness of breath. And now we're seeing a lot more fatigue, fever, of course, and we're seeing more sore throat with the Delta variant. So what that means, it looks a lot more like garden variety influenza uh, than did the COVID before. And so we have to be extra special careful. And so if you or a loved one or a friend or a colleague has had one of these high risk exposures, uh, the peak time to get tested is somewhere between three and five days. And, if you, and that's a really important consideration because if you test positive, you may be eligible for some of this monoclonal antibody therapy or other therapeutics, which could keep you out of the hospital and uh, hopefully uh, keep you working and uh, fully functional. Excellent. Thank you so much for that call from Arizona. Next is Ernie from California. Thanks for joining us, Ernie. Go right ahead. Yeah. Hi, Dr. Gold. Thank you for the show. And um, I was vaccinated with the Moderna uh, in February and March, and just had a mild reaction, really, to the second shot. Um, but I heard yesterday, and I don't know if this is true or not, uh, someone was, a friend was telling me that if you have the Moderna, you have a two and a half times a greater risk of heart inflammation. Now, he used a medical term for the type of inflammation, and I was wondering if that's true. And if it is, is that just after the shot, or is that an ongoing thing that could crop up sometime? So I'll ask uh, Dr. Anderson in just a minute, but I think what you're referring to, Ernie, is the reports of what we call myocarditis, which, as you describe, is an inflammation of the heart muscle, particularly seen in young men uh, following the uh, Moderna uh, mRNA uh, uh, immunization. Uh, Dr. Anderson, do you have thoughts about how long that period lasts and uh, what the frequency of that might be? And most importantly, is it of any consequence to the uh, individuals who get it? So, and I think this is a great question. I think we think this is happening about six to seven out of 10,000, um, more than the typical myocarditis from a virus infection would be in the population in general. So there, 
there is a risk there, but I think you know, we, we don't understand exactly why this is happening. Um, it's not very clear. Is it associated with other things that just happen to coincidentally be a, 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 in time with the, the injection? It's, just, it's not really quite clear what it is. The long-term consequence, I think, has been negligible. Um, it's been a little bit of, a, of inflammation as we see it based on studies we do that resolve quite quickly. Um, and so I don't think it's a huge impact. It's clearly not as significant as actually acquiring the COVID-19 in itself. So when you balance the risk of the infection of COVID-19 versus the antibody or the immunization, um, it's clearly a better choice to take and get immunized. All right, thank you so much for that call, Ernie. Next up is Terry of Texas. Thanks for joining us. You're on with the medical professionals for you from UNMC. Go right ahead, Terry. Thank you for taking my call. I'm uh, 73, and we live in a very rural area of Texas, and we had our shots come in last April, and they eventually sit in the Texas National Guard to do the distribution. Are we going to have to go through that again, or will uh, the vaccine be avail more available uh, through a pharmacy or other, you know, other areas? You know, Terry, uh, I believe that the vaccine will be far more available than it was back in the early spring when it was uh, the, where they were just ramping up the manufacturing. I know in our community here in both rural and urban uh, Nebraska, uh, most of the pharmacies, some of the food stores uh, have access to it. The local public health departments are setting up te uh, tents uh, for, for instance, uh, we have an uh, upcoming event. Uh, you know, athletic event that is scheduled uh, on one of the university campuses. And uh, we set up, uh, we'll be setting up some vaccine tents around there as well. So first of all, thanks to the National Guard. Thanks to all those students and staff and others from our med centers across the country who volunteered their time uh, to give these vaccinations when there was no one else and no other way to do it. But I'm hoping, Terry, that uh, even in... Uh, rural, even the smallest rural communities, you'll have plenty of an opportunity to get your booster dose. And, you know, I'll tell you, uh, when the day comes that it's available, uh, please do it. Uh, I think the data is very solid that it will help. And, you know, we haven't unpacked this yet because I'm sure we will get a question is what are the reactions like to the booster doses? But let me preempt it by saying minimally different, uh, if, if at all, from the original vaccine. So just as safe very effective, and indeed markedly raises your antibody levels. Oh, thank you so much for that call. We certainly appreciate it, Terry from Texas. You know, I want to bring Dr. Anderson back into the conversation now because you are in a very unique position. You have been studying this virus for a very long time, from the Diamond Princess, from all the citizens that were repatriated to UNMC to this point now. And we do understand that COVID has unfortunately taken the lives of many people, but many also recover, and some even have just mild or asymptomatic cases. Does this disease still leave a lasting impact even for those who fully recover or never got very sick? Tell us more about that, if you will. So I, I do think there are individuals that do have a lasting impact, um, you know, from pretty significant, you know, disabilities related to the infection. Um, to mild symptoms, whether it's just some mild shortness of breath, you know, just not able after months and months to go back and do the exercise that they used to do. And an example I have is a patient who used to run, and, he, and he'll say six months later, I still cannot achieve the same level of activity I had six months ago. Um, it doesn't have any real obvious problems, but it clearly symptoms there. So I do think there's a spectrum, and I think what we're learning is now one year out, there is an impact, but how does this impact us 10 years from now? An individual who had no symptoms, do they kind of progress slowly? I, we don't know. I think that's my worry. Um, so I think there is some that clearly do have some and some that's less and time will tell the rest. What can you tell us about long COVID or long haulers? Does this have any relation to an impact on the heart or the cardiovascular system for the people that you do know have those long hauler effects? 
I think it's interesting we see a spectrum of individuals, whether it's they have cognitive, that kind of brain fog that's been described, whether they have some myocarditis that we've seen with some of our scanning imaging tools, um, or just complete heart, heart failure that have really gotten into trouble. I mean, the most tragic scenarios are when somebody's immunosuppressed and we've had heart failure or they've died from heart problems related to that. Um, so I, I, you know, it, it can be systemic and I still kind of think that it's cardiovascular related in the blood vessels and all the organs and damaging of tissue subtly or greater in some um, and, and how it presents can be a little varied. Mm. Uh, you know, we often talk that you lose your brain and you lose your heart. You know, those are organs that are a high impact. You know, if you have a little muscle atrophy and wasting, you can be weak. And we have people that are weak in the muscles. They're large muscles that don't have the strength that they had before. So it really can be across the body uh, impacts on different organs. You know, heart disease is the number one killer of both men and women. So the work that you're doing right now is so important. And we do appreciate your time tonight. We're going to go back to the phones. Laverne in Colorado joins the conversation. Thanks for joining us. Go right ahead, Laverne. Okay. Um, I'm calling from Colorado, and I, my 62-year-old son did not get vaccinated, and he is about four weeks uh, into COVID. And um, when he gets over it, how soon can he go get a uh, a vaccination? Well, thanks for that question, Laverne. And the current recommendations by the FDA, and I'm sure now in the so-called package insert uh, from uh, Pfizer, uh, is this 30 days. So as, just as a general rule of thumb, when you're completely over it, uh, wait 30 days. Uh, this, we know whether it's three weeks or five weeks is probably not going to make a huge amount of difference, but he definitely should get the vaccine. And the reason being is that we have seen that the antibody level, the degree of immunity that you develop from having the infection uh, is significantly lower and less sustainable than the immunization that occurs from getting the vaccine itself. And the combination of the two by the way, of having been infected and getting a full dose of two doses of the mRNA vaccines is yet even stronger and more enduring. So for all of those reasons, uh, I hope he recovers quickly uh, and then uh, time to roll up his sleeve. Mm. We all hope that he recovers quickly. That's a really great question. Thank you so much for that. We appreciate you, Laverne. You know, Dr. Anderson, some say that they are hesitant about getting the vaccine because they don't know the long-term effects of the vaccine. But when we talk about the long-term effects that you're already discovering from COVID, like heart conditions, talk a little bit more about why it's so important to roll up your sleeve, especially right now. So I think if you take the example we talked about earlier, you know, the risk of, you know, the vaccine and the, and the very one in 10,000 or seven in 10,000 risk of having trouble, um, uh, you know, the, the vaccine has been sh shown, as Dr. Gold has mentioned, to be a very safe and one of the safest vaccines that we've ever had available for treating and, and preventing a viral infection. Um, I think that just the severity of the infection and, the, and how people feel, um, I've had people describe, I would never want to do that again. You know, I, and then, at the, like you said, it's, it, and we're talking about what's the long haul impact um, the balance of, is this a safe vaccine? Yes. What's the consequence of the infection? Great, especially with the Delta variant, as we were previously discussing. So for me, in the research I've done and knowing the literature about the vaccine and all that, it's, it's, a, it's an easy decision, but I, I do understand the hesitancy and it's about the education such that people can feel as confident that I feel about how I should get the vaccine, which I did. And when the booster is available, absolutely, I'll roll the sleeve up. Uh, I will as well. You know, I might have to wait a little bit longer than some, but I'm ready for that booster. I do not want to get this virus. I've seen what it can do. We're going to go back to the phones. Alice from Texas joins the conversation. Thanks for joining us. Alice, go right ahead. Yes, hi. I'm 65 years old, and I've had epilepsy for 55 years since 1966. 
and I have migraines too, and I eat the ketogenic diet to keep my epilepsy, my seizures away, but I've just been afraid to get the vaccine because they said people with brain diseases are, are in higher dangers, and I just wanted to know if that was correct. Well, Alice, uh, always the answer is to talk to your healthcare professional first because every patient is different, depends on what medications you're on, etc. But people with epilepsy uh, or other major brain diseases, neurologic diseases, are strongly encouraged uh, to get this vaccine. And the reason being is that you're at much higher risk if you were to get COVID. The incidence of hospitalization for people that have pre-existing heart disease, people that have had a stroke, uh, people that have uh, diabetes, high blood pressure, et cetera. Uh, even now, recently, some very strong data about pregnancy showing that uh, COVID and pregnancy are do not mix. Uh, indeed, the amount of fetal loss and the amount of pregnancy complications uh, uh, and need for sections, et cetera, goes dramatically up in women who uh, become infected uh, during their preg pregnancy and indeed uh, uh, immediately after during uh, breastfeeding. And so uh, my advice, and I'm sure that the, your healthcare providers can give you more detail locally, uh, but uh, you certainly should strongly consider getting vaccinated, particularly with all that's going on with the Delta variant with the very, very high contagion rates. All right. Thank you so much for that call, Alice. And that leaves a line open for you tonight, 877-731-6733. We're going to pause for a quick break, but we'll take more of your calls on the other side. Thank you so much for joining us. More Rural Health Matters right after this. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. Joining us once again tonight, world-renowned Dr. Jeffrey Gold. And also, Dr. Daniel Anderson has joined the conversation as well. And we still have time to take your phone call. We want to hear from you tonight, 877-731-6733. You might just have a question that will help somebody else who's watching out there tonight. This next question is for the two of you. When it comes to the anecdotal reports that we've seen about people suffering from long COVID symptoms for months now, but seeing it clear up after receiving the vaccine, can you tell us more about any further research that's been done on this? Dr. Gold, let's start with you. Sure. Well, this is uh, not just uh, anecdotal information. It's actually quite real. And there have been some studies that have been done. And the uh, last one that I'm familiar with shows that as many as 40 to 45 percent of individuals that have had some of the long haul symptoms like weakness, uh, so-called brain fog or confusion, uh, lethargy, et cetera, inability to sleep well, uh, do get better when fully vaccinated. So, uh, Dr. Anderson, uh, do you have any experience in this area, or are you aware of a more recent study? You know, I I honestly do not know of a more recent study, but I, you know, and I have not specifically run into an individual yet in my my care. Um, I think that it's a, it's an interesting scenario to study and learn the immunology of of infections. Um, I think there's lots of ideas out there, but. I, it's it's a it's a real thing, as Dr. Gold says, where sunlight clears up, which tells you there's that lingering immune response that extends past the virus that somehow the vaccine is able to rebalance. Um, it'll be an interesting finding once we learn what that is. You know, something else. It's interesting also to know how long it lasts, whether it's really yes. a durable solution or it just buys 30, 60, 90 days of uh, and again, you know, we learn more about the science of this virus every day. Yeah, you know, my husband, yep. after he had the vaccine, he did notice a difference. He said that he was thinking more clearly. I don't know if that helps, but I thought it was interesting. And by golly, I trust that man. All right. I want to talk some, about something that has been making headlines. Dr. Anderson, one of the fears, especially for athletes who may have had COVID, was that COVID survivors might be left with a heart inflammation condition. You may have heard about this as well at home called myocarditis. But that hasn't been in the news as much lately. What can you tell us about it? So what we saw originally in the earlier stages was that the, when a few of these studies came out after uh, COVID-19, when we were imaging with what we call magnetic resonance imaging, was that there was edema and swelling, which was concerning that it would be some damage. 
Um, there are individuals that progress to damage, and this ends up being what we call uh, non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. In other words, a heart that doesn't work well, doesn't squeeze well, that's not due to a heart attack, but due to damage from a virus. And this is common with the flu. It's common with a whole host of viruses that we see. We're just learning now that COVID is also associated with that. So the concern was, is if you're an athlete and you have COVID and you overdo or overstress, you know, you could end up with some myocarditis that could have, cause some permanent injury long term. So we fell back to our guidelines for managing myocarditis and managing myocarditis in COVID patients and just being quite cautious about screening patients, you know, when they are an athlete so they don't get into an exertional state that causes even more damage. So I think it's about being smart when you're infection, not overdoing it, not excessively exercising so that you cause damage when you already have a viral infection. But you can link it back to COVID. I wonder about vaccines. Have there been any cases of heart inflammation tied to vaccine doses? So there have been some. And I think that this is where the, the, the research has showed that the incidence of myocarditis does appear to be greater after a vaccine, but not as great as the infection itself. So remembering that if there's one in a couple in 10,000 developed myocarditis after the vaccine, um, the development of myocarditis after COVID is sometimes 30%. So it's a one in three versus seven in 10,000. So the incidence of the myocarditis is significantly greater after you have the infection. Going back to once again, you need to get the vaccine to prevent the severe infection and the myocarditis and the risk of myocarditis with just the vaccine is pretty low. Wow. You know, it's interesting how important the vaccine is and how we might see them become more and more mandatory. But when you go to get the vaccine, they just give you this flimsy little piece of paper that's handwritten. I wonder, is this going to change Dr. Gold? And I mean, mine already has a bite taken out of it for my child. I just, you know, it's a little curious as to something so important, such an important document how it's not laminated, it's kind of flimsy. Do you think this is going to change going forward? Yeah, I do. And, you know, one of the things we've done is uh, we use a uh, smartphone app. I don't know if our audience can see it, but it, that would be my uh, federal card. And it, we use OCR, optical character recognition, uh, to scan it. So it has all of the codes that are so critical on the, on the uh, card. And indeed, that has been used in many times. Uh, I, sh I hesitate to call it a vaccine passport because it's not really that. But it's a coded way. And indeed, uh, whether it's in California, New York, uh, other parts of the country, uh, there are multiple free apps that are available that will do that. Or alternatively, Christina, you know, you can just take a uh, photo uh, of your card. Unfortunately, uh, you know, uh, as our audience probably knows, there are all kinds of counterfeit cards that are available on, you know, lots of different websites and through social media. Uh, certainly, uh, they will not have the little stickers and the little codes that are in, contained in the FDA-issued card, which is really critical to uh, validation. You know, uh, let's face it, uh, who are you really kidding if you go down that route? You know, if you're going to uh, use a counterfeit card, to gain access to an athletic or sporting event, to a concert, uh, to a restaurant for dinner with family and loved ones, uh, and you do have COVID or you think you may have COVID or somebody else has COVID and you're not vaccinated, uh, you're not protecting yourself, you're not protecting your loved ones, you're not protecting the community, you're going to help uh, really limit access to schools, and churches with the Delta variant. And so... Uh, no benefit to be kidding anybody at this time. You know, let's spend a little time here on, on breakthrough cases, because for some people who were fully vaccinated, they got back out into the world maskless, and now they're scared to go back out because they're worried about getting a breakthrough case of the Delta variant. Can you kind of break down who is at risk, who really should be isolating if they are concerned, and, and how severe cases are for somebody who possibly is in the vulnerable group if they do get a breakthrough case of the Delta variant? Sure. So, you know, there are a number of things that are going on simultaneously. One is that, as is the case with almost all vaccines, over a period of time, your antibody levels, your blood immunity levels will fall, even though your body 
has other mechanisms to recognize viruses and bacteria and other infections, but your blood levels will fall over time. And we've seen that with all of the vaccines that are EUA and now most recently FDA certified uh, in the United States. How much, how fast remains to be seen. Second thing that's happened is that we're now not dealing with the same virus that we were dealing with a year and a half ago when these vaccines were being developed. We are dealing predominantly, over 90% in the United States now, with Delta variant, uh, which is more able to evade the vaccines. Not completely, but more able to evade the vaccines in such a way that the infection rates, the so-called breakthrough infection rates, are higher. But what is absolutely clear is that these vaccines markedly reduce hospitalization and they markedly reduce death rates. Now, whether that will be true for the next variant that follows Delta and the one that follows that, et cetera, remains to be seen. But right now, the single most important thing we can do uh, is get vaccinated. And even though there is a significant amount of breakthrough infection, as Delta is extremely contagious and as the vaccines start to wear off, and that's why the boosters, Christina, are going to be important. And so if you look at hospitalization of people with breakthrough infection, what you see is they're typically older. They typically have weakened immune systems. We call them immunocompromised, which is why uh, the Food and Drug Administration and the Centers for Disease Control have been recommending booster shots starting actually last week. And we're immunizing quite a bit of our solid organ transplants, our bone marrow transplant patients, some of our cancer patients, and many others who are at higher risk, uh, and they should be first in line uh, to get the booster shots. And they are, uh, which is very appropriate. Absolutely. Thank you for clearing that up. I know a lot of people have questions about the breakthrough cases right now. I wanted to give Dr. Anderson an opportunity to share his final thoughts. And for our audience, you may not know this, but he didn't know right away that he wanted to be a doctor. And thank God you decided (laughs) to take on that responsibility. What are your final thoughts for our audience tonight? You know, I, I, it's been a pleasure to sit and visit with everybody. I think, you know, we've talked about a lot of important things. I think, the, you know, as Dr. Gold just emphasized, the most important is to get that vaccine and to continue to protect yourself from getting infected, you know, be it a mask and all the things that we've done for the past year. Um, I think we're learning a lot about viruses and cardiovascular disease. Um, and, you know, the time is is right to get the vaccine and the booster when it comes up. So. Um, it's been a pleasure and happy to answer any questions at any time. Oh, we're grateful for you. And Dr. Gold, your final thoughts for us tonight? Sure. Just to make the point, Christina, that the science continues to change. And that's why the messaging, the policies, uh, the best advice from the CDC, the FDA, from your local healthcare professional, your hospitals, continues to change as well. We have to be cognizant, aware of what the science is telling us. And as the science informs us, we have to give our best advice to the audience and we have to give our best advice uh, to our patients and the communities that we serve. And that can be confusing because as the virus changes and as we learn more about the virus, our advice is going to change. It's going to continue to change. I'm aware of that. But the audience needs to understand that that change is all for the better. Uh, We appreciate your transparency. Thank you both so much for joining us. Thank you at home. Wishing you a beautifully blessed evening.